is up, everybody? Welcome to another episode of Limited Resources. This is episode number 696. My name is Marshall. I'm one of your limited resources, and joining me on the line all the way from Denver, Colorado, it's Luis Scott Vargas. Luis, you've been drafting? Oh, yeah. I uh, did two long streams, drafted a bunch on each of those, and then drafted at night, too. <laughs> yeah. Been, 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 been jamming. The, the very short uh, initial impression is that this format is, is awesome. Oh, that's good. Yeah, yeah. I've had a good time with it so far as well. Feels very swingy. You know, like you could definitely come back. Oh, it's back. got that. Yeah, <laughs> which I think is a good thing for a format. So there's a lot to talk about here. But one thing that we didn't get to on the set reviews um, were the bonus sheet. And of course, you know, I was raving about how much I love the bonus sheet on uh, any time that they've used it, actually. And they've done it again here with this one extra slot in the pack that are all reprints and all sort of carefully selected cards of certain types and certain, uh, you know, versions, etc. And so what we're going to do on this epi episode of the show is we're going to go over each of those for you set review style, because they do end up impacting the format in a significant way. And you're going to need to know what they do. And some of these are they kind of have a lot going on. Some of them don't. But we're going to go over each and every one of those here on the episode. And then we're going to see at the end, if we have time to do our format overview, uh, it may be broken out into a separate episode. Uh, but either way, uh, we're going to dive into these cards before we do. We just wanted to say thank you to everybody on our Patreon. Um, they are who are supporting us and we really appreciate it. It's patreon.com slash limited resources. If you're interested in supporting us over there, um, Luis, do you want to do the grading scale overview for this? Yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll do a uh, slightly abridged version, which is we've got grades that go from A to F, and we've got two subgrades. The A's, you'll find a lot of in this bonus sheet, trust me. These are the bombs. These are the best cards in the set, the cards that are awesome even when you're behind or sometimes especially. B's are cards that actively pull you towards their colors or combination of colors. Uh, you know, we're talking cards like Cinder Slash Ravager, Rebel Salvo, like kind of the top uncommons and top commons. C's are playable. These are the kind of interchangeable pawns of limited. You end up with a lot of these cards like Volt Charger, Blight Belly Rat. Not as many C's in the bonus sheet. There's a lot of these cards are pretty high impact. D's are cards that are sometimes playable, but you would prefer not to run them. These are kind of like on mediocre cards, a little expensive and uh, not exactly what you want to be. These are cards like uh, Cruel Grimnark or Sinew Dancer. F's are straight up unplayable. Less in the bonus sheet, actually, than normal rares because the bonus sheet uh, has a bunch of legends and they don't make bad legends anymore. <laughs> so uh, <laughs> you, you'll be able to to find out what the how those work uh, when you take a, when you take a look at some of the very rare instances of Fs here. Uh, we're talking cards like Mind Splice Apparatus, and then sideboard. These are cards that you would sideboard, but not uh, main deck. The bonus sheet doesn't really have a lot of those, to be honest. And then. Um, you have build arounds and the bonus sheet does have some of those for sure. These are cards that on their own don't do enough, but you can build around them and they can be quite strong. Uh, you know, just cards like uh, artifact matters, build arounds, or, you know, something like all will be one from new Frexia. Yeah. The theme for this uh, bonus sheet is multiverse legends. And, you know, these are kind of representative legends from all around different planes, which you'll see plays out in the, in the set as well. The other thing to note here is, you know, we were talking, uh, me, you and producer Jeff before the show, and Jeff made a good point. He said, look, these cards didn't fall from the sky, right? These were hand selected cards. And so what our challenge is, and this is kind of cool that we've actually got a few drafts under our belt before looking at this is to figure out either which archetype this card might be kind of geared towards, or if there's any card two card combos or anything like that, that work particularly well with any of these cards. And, uh, I watched your opening stream, Luis, and I saw a particularly strong two card combo that you, uh, deployed multiple times. We'll talk about that when we actually get to the card. So let's jump in. Our first card up is Anafenza Kintry Spirit. This is white, white for a 2-2 legendary spirit soldier at rare. I will note that the rarity on these cards is rare, uncommon, or mythic rare, but they still only appear um, once per pack, No, regardless of their rarity. It's just how often each card appears in that slot that the rarity affects. So, the, And so this is a white, white 2-2. It says whenever another non-token creature enters a battlefield under your control, bolster one and bolster is choose a creature with the least toughness among the creatures you control and put a plus one plus one counter on it. So pretty obvious here, Luis, right? This one goes into the green white deck. 
uh, or any deck that can reliably cast it and has a lot mm -hmm. of creatures because getting a plus one this gives you a plus one plus one counter every time a non-token creature enters the battlefield under mm -hmm. your control which also counts flipped battles by the way because they they, mm -hmm. they come in as a creature and they're not a token getting a plus one plus one counter for every creature you play is amazing so yes and offensive is a very good card just play a lot of creatures on offensive in green white, it's better, but it's good regardless, which gives uh, makes on offense a, a B plus. Like yes. there's some games where it won't do a ton, but if you play this early and it doesn't die, you're going to win that game fairly easily. The only consideration with this card is the white white mana cost. Just make sure that you can you know reliably have that somewhat early in the game. Next has the same mana cost. It's Daxos Blessed by the Sun, white white for a two star. This is a legendary enchantment creature, demigod at uncommon. Daxos' toughness is equal to your devotion to white, which is the white mana symbols in the cost of permanence you control. Um, so that does count his own. So he's two, two to start with, but that toughness can actually get kind of comically out of hand sometimes two, seven two eight. when, and then he's also got the ability, whenever another creature you control enters the battlefield or dies, you gain a life. So this one doesn't seem to fit quite as well into the format, right? No, it, it's totally fine, but, mm -hmm. uh, it's not, uh, not a bomb. I mean, when you, when you have Daxos in play, you're going to gain a bunch of random life. You're going to be able to uh, have a big blocker, and that's pretty good for white-white. You're not asking a ton, right? You're, you're, no. All, all you're saying is, like, play this card and play, again, a bunch of creatures, preferably ones with white pips uh, in their casting costs. So I would give Daxos a B-. It's, it's a good addition to any deck. Yeah, it's right in that C plus B- minus range. It's better than the commons, you know, at that stage, but this is not nearly as good as on Offensa for the mana cost. Uh, next up is SRAM Senior Edificer. This is one in a white for a 2-2 legendary dwarf advisor at rare. And it says, whenever you cast an aura, equipment, or vehicle spell, draw a card. <laughs> there are a few auras, equipments, and vehicles in the set. They, they are all represented on some level, but not pushed super hard. I, you know, I struggle to, to think of the deck that is like all in on that where SRAM is, is your best card. Um, this feels more like a two mana two, two with a little bit of upside. Yeah, I think that's exactly what it is. It's you, you're happy enough to have this card uh, in your deck and most white decks will have a couple ways to get, get a little value from it, but you're not, you're not building your entire deck around it. It's not, it's rarely going to be the most important card in your deck, but if it draws just one card, you're pretty happy. So I would yes. give SRAM a B. Yeah. Just if you get card. three triggers, you know, in your whole deck on it and one of them comes up, you're just going to be like, that's awesome. Right. But again, it, this is more in the, the Daxos level than the on offense on offense. can be the best card in your deck. Like if you put this on turn two and they don't kill it, you're going to win. <clears throat> so this is a different level first round. Never going to be the best card in my deck. I draft better decks than that. But, <laughs> you know, I'll, I'll, I'll let you speak for yourself, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> hey, that card's amazing on turn two, man. Like people, people uh, lose to that all day. Uh, next is Thalia, Guardian of Thraben. This is the one in a white 2-1 legendary human soldier at rare. She's got first strike and non-creature spells cost one more to cast. Of note, uh, that does affect both players. If you've never played with Thalia, she's kind of a pain in that way. Uh, but you do get a really powerful, you know, two on first strike, great combat tricks, great with plus one, plus one counters. And generally speaking, in aggressive white decks, the uh, the non-creature spells costing more tends to uh, disproportionately affect your opponent. Yeah, Thalia is fantastic. And just having a Thalia on turn two just puts you so far ahead on board that even if it's taxing you both equally, which like you said, is probably not the case, you'd still be pretty happy. Yeah. Um, I think I still like Thalia at B. Yeah, I would give Thalia a B. I mean, you're going to every now and then play a matchup where your opponent's just completely boned by it. They're, yes. they're, they're, they're playing blue red convoke and you play Thalia turn two, they can't cast their rouse summons on turn two. And all of a sudden the game's just, you know, completely off the rails for them. But most of the time, Thalia is going to be a solid B. Yep. Uh, next is Quende, Pride of Femoref. This is three and a white for a 2-2 two -two legendary human knight at Uncommon. Quende has double strike, and creatures you control with first strike, well, they get a little upgrade. They have double strike, as long as Quende's out there. So base level, four mana, 2-2 two -two double strike. Where are you at on that? 
That's just okay. I mean, it's just we're, okay, we're, right? We're at, we're at the point in, in Magic and this set's super high power level. A four mana, four, kind of like two two double strike slash four two, whatever you want to call it, just not that good. Uh, it's and it needs help. Yeah, there's not a lot of incidences the first strike. So I found Quinta to be like a C C minus. Yeah. Just you're not going to play it that often. It is a night though, so so you know that you do have to keep that in mind. Yeah, and the same thing that I mentioned for Thalia goes for this. Plus one, plus one counters, equipment. Those things do make Quende a big threat, but uh, the four man is a tough initial investment. Next is Kenrith, the Returned King. This is four and a white for a 5-5 five, five legendary human noble. This one's a mythic rare. So, I mean, by the way, just straight off the bat, we've got a five mana 5-5, five, five, which is, generally speaking, going to be the biggest thing on the battlefield for its mana cost. So that's already pretty sweet. And this bad boy has five different activated abilities and they all are sweet first one is you can pay a red to give all creatures trample and haste until end of turn and that does include kenrith if you happen to have an extra red floating around um, you can pay one in a green to put a plus one plus one counter on a creature you can pay two in a white to have target player gain five life you can pay three in a blue to have target player draw a card and you can pay four in a black to have uh, to put target creature card from a graveyard onto the battlefield under its owner's control. Don't get trapped <laughs> on that one. If you you can target your opponent's creatures with this, but they will be the recipient of that creature. So this this is a card that was designed for multiplayer play where you can use Kenrith to kind of manipulate the game. Well, I'll give you five life if you don't attack me. How about you draw a card? I'll put a plus one plus one counter on my creature. But of course, in in heads up play and in one on one, you know, these are all going to be for you. So that last ability is really just aiming at, at cards in your graveyard. But Kenrith is like unreal, right? Like, depending on what you can do uh, as far as the activation ability goes, it just gets better and better. Yeah, Kenrith's an A. I mean, mm -hmm. there's just no, no, no ifs, ands, or buts about it. It's going to be the card that matters most on the battlefield when it's in play. Yeah. It depends. And also, it doesn't matter what color combination you are. Yes, it is better if you have the right color combination. You know, I think uh, of those abilities, you always have access to white if you're playing Kenrith. Green's very good. Blue's good. Black's good. Red is like the weakest, but it doesn't really matter. There's no there's no two color combination where I'm like not excited to play Kenrith. Yeah, I think I think maybe blue's the weakest. Yeah, you don't have enough time to do a ton of that, yeah, I suppose. But, but whatever. But you're right. It doesn't matter. If if you can cast Kenrith, then you should cast Kenrith. And I probably would toss in a, a gain land for an off-color ability, you know, particularly ones that affect the board, like the green one putting counters around can can really mess with combat. You can wait till they block. Like, it's just stupid how good this card is. And as you mentioned, you always have access to white. That prolongs the game. Uh, and when you have this guy out, that's definitely what you want. So A for Kenrith, the Return King. Next, the OG, Elish Norn, Grand Cenobite. This is five white, white for a 4-7 legendary Phyrexian Praetor at Mythic. She's got Vigilance and other creatures you control get plus two, plus two, which is a lot more than it seems. Like that, that is a devastating play that even just the turn you play it and get a big attack in, it is huge. It swings the board completely. But if that wasn't enough, creatures your opponents control get minus two, <laughs> minus two, which is equally as bad. Just simply getting this card on the battlefield so that it has enough time to check game-based actions is great. <laughs> if it sticks around, the game's just over. Uh, I've Nobody ever beats Elishorn. This is a type of card that even in cube, where people are playing huge, stupid creatures, Elishnorn coming down can... It's not just like... I think people see this and they go... Well, it's pretty good against small creature decks. It's like, no, no, no. This is just good against everything. Your your, your one ones can now trade for their five vibes. So, <laughs> I, I mean, Elish Nord is an A plus. There's just yes. no way around it. It's so, a, it's one of the best cards. Yeah. Uh, the the uh, only caveat is the mana cost at seven. But uh, in my brief experience with the format, that. you are able to play seven drops. So, which by the way makes Itali that dinosaur just even the more silly. Like you actually just get the Casa thing. Ridiculous card. Um, next is Baral, Chief of Compliance, which is one in a blue for a one three legendary human wizard at rare. Instant and sorcery spells you cast cost one less to cast. And whenever a spell or ability you control counters a spell, you may draw a card. If you do, discard a card. So this guy looks. This looks like a plant for the for the blue red deck, I suppose. Yeah, it's good in the convoke deck. You you end up uh, getting a, a decent little cheap body that 
naturally lowers the spells. I mean, this already makes it too lower, right? Yeah. So you're, you're pretty happy with kind of how that all works. And uh, I think that uh, Brawl is not a card I'd want any combination other than blue-red or sometimes blue-black. You could Because there's there's blue-black convoke builds too. But definitely, uh, definitely a good one. Build around B for Brawl? Build around B, yeah. Yeah. Uh, next up is Tetsuko Umezawa Fugitive, which is one in a blue for a 1-3 legendary human rogue at Uncommon. And creatures you control with power or toughness, one or less, can't be blocked. So Tetsuko is, is one that's really have been helped by us playing for a bit because I think Tetsuko would have been our initial grade would have been like C and mm -hmm. I think Tetsuko is actually a straight up B mm -hmm. like it's been really impressive to just pick away at battles the blue red deck makes a bunch of one one tokens the knights decks have like a three one at common like all those things add up and Tetsuko is a really annoying card that when my opponent has it I frequently am using a removal spell to kill it that's just kind of the sign of a of, of a good card it is and on, on a simple card that's easy to cast at just one in a blue that's a big compliment Right. I mean, if they have to use removal on your random two drop here, then, you know, maybe your four drop actually sticks. So, yeah, I like B for Tetsuku as well. Very annoying in this set and uh, doesn't really ask much of you. Next is Emery Lurker of the Lock. This is two and a blue for a one two legendary merfolk wizard at rare. This spell costs one less to cast for each artifact you control. And when Emery enters the battlefield, you mail four cards and you can tap it and choose target artifact in your graveyard. You may cast that card this turn. You still have to pay for the costs and stuff, but you can just cast it. This is the one that's felt the most lost to me. There's not a strong artifacts theme that makes me just go, oh, Emery just slots right into this deck and is awesome. You know, there's some random value to be gotten, but, you know, a lot of the artifacts that we're dealing with in this set are the incubator tokens, and, and those don't do much with Emery. I mean, maybe makes Emery a little cheaper, but who cares? Yeah, Emery is just not really a, not really, this isn't really the set for Emery, so I, I would give Emery an F. I just don't yeah. really see it, see it fitting. Yeah. I've passed it and had it wheel every time I've seen it. Next is Inga Rune Eyes. This is three and a blue for a 3-3 legendary human wizard at Uncommon. When Inga enters the battlefield, you scry three. And when Inga dies, draw three cards if three or more creatures died this turn. So just I'm at not... face value, how are you on four mana, three, three, scry three when it ETBs? It's playable fringe, right? Like that's really well, not that exciting. But I'm not exciting. excited about it. Yeah. And, uh... I think that uh, I think that you can do you can do a lot better. Like the 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 whole joke with this is you set up a combat where this trades with one other creature and then something else either trades off or use a removal spell. And uh, I don't think that uh, you're you're going to end up doing that very often. At it least my experience with the format happens. has been that it, that doesn't really happen. It's it's a consideration on the battlefield, but that's about it. It effectively never happens that you get the three cards. It's very rare. Your opponent basically has to make a mistake for that to happen. Yeah. I would think I, it goes a C. Yeah, just a C, right? You can play this card in your deck, but it just doesn't do anything really impressive. Next is Jin Gataxius Core Augur. This is eight blue, blue. You heard me right. 10 mana for a 5 4 legendary Phyrexian Praetor at Mythic. It's got flash. And at the beginning of your end step, draw seven cards. That's right. You just. Hit your end step and you just draw seven. Each opponent's maximum hand size is reduced by seven to theoretically zero. Yeah. Powerful card, but at 10 mana, it is not castable. This no. is an F. Do it's, not it's put Jinka Daxis in your deck. No, it's also, it kills you very quickly. Like yeah, you, you also just, if seven cards a turn, you, you, two turns of that, by the time you hit Jinka Taxius in play, is probably going to kill you. Yeah. And I mean, because think about the, the math for it. It costs 10 mana. So you need over half of your lands. That means that you're at least over half of your library through on average. <laughs> That's only leaving you 20 cards or less. And uh, and so like you said, a couple of turns and you're just dead to Jin Kataxius anyway. So F, that moves us to the black cards. Uh, first one is Timoret Chosen from Death. This is black black for a two star legendary enchantment creature demigod at uncommon. Its toughness is equal to your devotion to black. So same thing as, as before with uh, What's his name? And then this one has one and a black, exile up to two cards from a gra uh, from graveyards. You gain one life for each creature card exiled this way. 
How much do we care about getting rid of graveyard cards in this set? Well, it's actually funny that you're more likely to target your own than your opponents in some mm. senses because there's the, the blue-black theme of having eight cards in the opponent's graveyard. Yeah. So if you're blue-black and you have that, you don't really want to be exiling their graveyard. Right. And if they are blue-black, <laughs> you want to exile your own stuff. But mostly what Timurna does is kind of like Daxos. It's a big blocker. It's like a 2-4, two, 2-5 two, some of the time. Note that battles count for devotion. Mm -hmm. And it gains you some life, maybe messes up their raised dead type cards. I think it's a B. It's a solid card. It's not something I'm going nuts about, but it definitely uh, kind of pulls its weight. Yeah, these cards do exactly that. They pull their weight and they're okay. We're really looking for the big upside cards here. You know, those are the ones that are more exciting. Next one is called Araya, First of Lockthwain, and this is black, black, black. So that's kind of the headliner here. The casting cost is triple black. What do you get for it? You get a legendary creature at rare that's a 2-3. Uh, she's an elf noble, and whenever Araya or another black creature enters, sorry, Ayara, or another black creature enters the battlefield under your control, each opponent loses one life and you gain one life. So you get a little Drano, and then you can tap Ayara, sacrifice another black creature, and to draw a card. I mean, it's a pretty I, I, sweet card if you can get it on the battlefield. Yeah, the main, main the main concern here is triple black. But I found between the uh, common, you know, gain lands, cards that make treasures, and the fact that uh, black is a fairly deep color, that you you could draft an Iara deck. I, I had it. I had her in a deck, and she was fantastic. I was just playing Nizumi informants and Icker drinkers and et etched familiars, and just like drain you, drain you, sack this, draw a card, drain you, you know, and, and it, it worked out really nicely. But you really, really have to focus on that mana cost. Yeah, you want 10, 11 black sources, you know, if you can get there, maybe 12. The deck I had her in had nine plus two swamp cyclers, and that ended up being about right, you know. It, okay. It was still it was still tricky sometimes. It wasn't it wasn't yeah. free. Um, what do you like, B for IRA? If B, just recognize the mana cost is is a lot. Hirobi Death's Whale is next. This is two black black for a 4-4 legendary spirit at rare with flying. And whenever a creature becomes the target of a spell or ability, destroy that creature. So the main interaction we're talking here is backup. Mm. But it's kind of funny because it cuts both ways where yeah. you're not hosing their backup cards because they backup can target any player's stuff. <laughs> They'll just play a backup card and kill Hirobi. <laughs> <laughs> or even worse, they'll play a backup card, kill your best, second best creature, then play another one and kill Hirobi. Oh whatever. God! I, I, yeah, I saw this so, card in a pack, and I and I was in the in black, and I'm like, oh, this is sweet. And then I'm like, wait, no, 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 no. And and of course, any repeatable or any type of ability, like they don't even have to use a full card to kill this thing. And frankly, you're not getting that much these days, right? Four mana, four four flyer isn't like a bomb anymore. I think that the main use of Hirobi, and this is a bad use, don't get me wrong, will will be. This plus your own backup cards. Okay. And and you're in like, black. all right. Like imagine imagine on five mana, you're like, Hirobi, Scornblade Berserker, the one mana 01, kill your best thing. Like, That's pretty cool. I mean, you you would feel all right about that, right? Like you I wouldn't would. feel I would. I, I'm gonna but, give Hirobi an F, but <clears throat> I think it's an F with a slight build around D. Okay. <laughs> kind, I like kind of that. I, and I want to see that deck. Like show me that deck. That would be sweet. Next is Saison. Is that how you say that? Saison? Saison. Saison. Per Perverter of Truth. This is three black black for a 6-5 legendary demon spirit at rare. At the beginning of each player's upkeep, that player loses two life and draws two cards. This is another F. Like, what, what wow. are you, you're going to, you're going to play this. You're going to, you're going to let them draw two, lose two, and then they're going to bounce or kill Sizon, And then you're going to feel really, yeah, I'm, really I'm bad it. about the whole exchange. What is so. this from? I don't actually know this card. Come go. Oh, oh, of course. Of course. Of course. All right. F for Sizon. Next is Scytherix, the Blight Dragon. This is three black, black for a four, four legendary Phyrexian dragon skeleton at mythic rare it does have flying and infect which means that it deals its damage to creatures in the form of minus one minus one counters and to players in the form of poison counters you can pay black to give scytherix haste until end of turn and you can pay black black to regenerate Scytherix, which they don't even use regenerate anymore but basically no. the short version is is the next time it would be destroyed it isn't 
gets tapped, removed from combat, etc. But at any rate, it's difficult to kill. It has haste and it kills your opponent in three turns if left unchecked. Yeah, the one downside of that three turns number is that whatever it hits, if if you partially kill them with poison, you hit them twice. Do they take eight poison? They don't take any normal damage. Then they kill Skitherex. You're probably not going to get that last two in. That's right. But I'm not really looking for four flying, hasty, regenerating dragons, you know, in in the mouth, as it were. So I I, I would say uh, for many reasons, I would say Skitherex gets an A minus. It's a good card. Yeah, really solid card, really great in combat. It does, if you have the double black up, they just can't attack into you very easily. So yeah, I like that. Next is Yargle, Glutton of Urborg. This is four and a black for a nine three. It's legendary frog spirit and uncommon. Have not seen the spot where I'm excited to run Yargle in the set. No, no, Yargle doesn't seem like the card you want. It, it was only even barely playable in... Uh, the Dominaria set original yeah. because of the legendary like spells where yes. you really needed a legend to have in play. Yes. As things currently stand, I, I think that Yargul is an F. Just, yeah, just it might be a D minus. Maybe or if you something. have some Voldar and Thrill Seekers and you're going to be flinging. Yeah, you know, that, sure. That, there's there's going to be something, but but just draft in and draft out. You're looking at a very barely playable card. Uh, next is Shieldred Whispering One. This is five black black for a six six legendary Phyrexian Praetor at Mythic. She's got Swamp Walk, and as at the beginning of your upkeep, return to our creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield, and at the beginning of each opponent's upkeep, that player sacrifices a creature. This card's absurd. Yeah, I mean, it, you're getting, again, seven mana worth. This isn't quite Elish Norn level because you have to wait a little bit to to really have it start to pop off, but mm-hmm. I mean, you're not, I'm not complaining about that. I yeah. think Shieldred's an A. Just, I would just give Shieldred an A, yeah. Put this but, card in your deck and use utilize it. Yeah, because you, you pass the turn and you get that initial sacrifice going right away, and if they ever can't kill it, like if they don't have sorcery speed and you get to come back and bring your best thing, like game's over. All right, that moves us to red. Ragavizi, Ragavon, Nimble per- Pilfer is here. This is red for a 2-1 legendary monkey pirate at Mythic. And whenever Ragavon uh, deals combat damage to a player, create a treasure token and exile the top card of that player's library. Until end of turn, you may cast that card. And Ragavon also has dash for one and a red, which lets you put it into play. And it has haste. And then at <clears throat> the beginning of the end step, you return it to your hand. Ragavan's nice. That is that. That's got to be the scariest thing to see on turn one in the format, right? <laughs> because in a, in a in in some ways, Ragavan is not as busted and limited as constructed. Right. But that doesn't change the fact that a turn one Ragavan is still just a turn one Ragavan. Like, what, what what are you gonna do? Yeah. And I would give Ragavan an A because of that. Like, look at look at it this way: if you don't draw Ragavan until turn five, it's it's like a C level card. It's a one mana two one with effectively no abilities. Right. Unless like somehow the board just gets cleared in the middle of the game or whatever. If you draw, draw, draw Ragavan and play it on turn one, you're just going to win that game. Yes. You will like, definitely win that game. <laughs> I, I always imagine the sound from Metal Gear Solid, you know, when somebody plays Ragavan, it's like, huh? you know, like, mm-hmm. what, yeah, exactly. The like startled sound. Yeah, exactly. Because exactly. like, especially because it's on the bonus sheet. I saw a stream where somebody had Ragavan get played against him. It was like, oh no, like, what am I going to do? I don't have a one drop. Um, so what do you want to give Ragavan? <clears throat> because like you said, this isn't just like an easy A, right? Like this card, like, even in situations sometimes where like you're on the draw, Ragavan is just okay, right? Like so, sometimes you just go like, they go land, you play Ragavan and they play a two drop. You don't have a removal spell and Ragavan is just staring it down. It's not like the game's over at that point. But look, here's the way I look at it. Ragavan, the floor on Ragavan is is not super high. It's a one mana, two one with maybe, maybe you can dash in if the board gets cleared, right? Yeah. But that is still... The, the ceiling is absurd. The ceiling is you play this turn one and the game ends. Mm-hmm. That that does sound like an A to me. Like you would all, you would take this. I would take this over Stoke the Flames, for example. I would like, too. When this is just in your opening hand, I think it's going to win you. And it's got too much opening hand equity for me to to really pass this for anything else. So that 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 gets an A for me. I mean, you could probably give it an A minus if you wanted to be a little bit more precise, but. If I open Ragavan and anything except like, yeah, if you open, uh, you know, a Sunfall or a Boon Giver Valkyrie or, or something like that, you should take those five mana cards that always win you the game. But a one mana card that when you play it on turn one sometimes draws you multiple cards and treasures like that, that, that's an, that, that is a level 
uh, performance for me. I'm going to give Raghavan a B. Well, you're, you're never going to pass it, so that's fine. Right. And what I'm recognizing is, is that my, I believe that this is our constructed bias creeping in. I, I think that not like I'm, I just, wonder, I'm just evaluating the card accurately. I, I wonder if, if Stoke the Flames has a higher win rate, you know, win rate than Raghavan by the end. I, it, I just wonder, here's my hunch, is that, yes, there are a few games where you have it on turn one and it takes over and you're like, wow. But I also think that like that, this is very susceptible to being the type of card that you always kind of view it in this like, uh, ideal scenario and it just doesn't happen right like it's just like ah oh, i had ragavan but they killed it oh i had ragavan but they played a couple of creatures oh man i couldn't quite get the board clear oh i drew it a little too late in the game and i just wonder if those scenarios are going to pile up enough so that ragavan is good you still want it you still want to have that that high upside turn one play because i mean this is effectively a two mana stats card for one mana so you're kind of already ahead of the game I just wonder, I really, I really wonder if it's going to be able to, you know, with any level of consistency, do its thing. So that that's, I'm going to give it, I'm going to give it a B plus for the upside. So we're actually fairly close, but I am really curious, but you are right. I'm taking it like that. I, I will take it. I love the potential upside of playing that on turn one and having my opponent stumble. Uh, next is Captain Lannery Storm. This is two and a red for a two, two legendary human pirate at rare. She's got haste. And whenever she attacks you create a treasure, and whenever you sacrifice a treasure, she gets plus one, plus zero until end of turn. Yeah, this is a solid card. I mean, it's it's uh, on an open board. You play this, you attack, you get a treasure. It's like a Fable the Mirror Breaker token, and you're pretty happy with that outcome, I think. Yeah, I think so, too. It's a good if card. you have to play this and run it into their like two drop to trade, if you get a treasure out of the deal, at least. It's like a Searing Barb. This is a playable card. It's not a super exciting one. I, I would give Captain Landers from a C plus. Yeah, I like I like B minus. Like you, you are generating a little bit of extra value, and haste is nice too. What about Squee the Immortal? One red red for a two one legendary goblin at rare. You may cast Squee from your graveyard or from exile. It just keeps coming back. Is that good? Like you're still just getting a two one over and over again. But I mean, I can't get rid of it. Yeah. I think that Squeeze not very good. Just casting a 2-1 over and over again for three mana is just not that exciting. Yeah. So I I am going to give Squee a, a C-. minus. I haven't I, – I try to make it work with multiple invasions of Mercadia, which actually makes sense because Squee is from Mercadia originally, oh, uh, I, I believe. Wow, look at or at least you. was the king there. And then uh, – and you discard it and you recast it. But you're still – you're paying three mana for a 2-1. That's just not – Something I'm super stoked about. Even if you're able to get some some value. Okay. Uh, yeah. So C range for Squee the Immortal. Next is Valduk, Keeper of the Flame. This is two and a red for a 3-2 legendary human shaman at Uncommon. At the beginning of combat on your turn, for each aura and equipment attached to Valduk, create a 3-1 red elemental creature token with trample and haste. Exile those tokens at the beginning of the next end step. Is this supported enough to play? I, I think that a two and a red three, two isn't like that is below the bar. Like you need more than that from your three drop, I think. So is this supported enough to actually put in the deck? I mean, you wouldn't need much more, right? No, one aura, I, one equipment. Sure. Throw a Valduk in there. Not for Valduk to be like a B minus. You think so? And, uh, yeah, I think I think like you have a halberd uh, and a great sword or something along those lines. Also, it's just how much do you want a three mana three two? And some of the red white decks that have Dejuru and Hazret, the legend of five four that plays a legend off the top six cards, oh, having sure. random legends can be good for for that sort of thing. Okay, so right in that in that B ish range, if if you've got anything to do it. All right, here's the card I was talking about at the top: Zada Hedron Grinder. This is. Three and a red for a 3-3 three, three legendary goblin ally at Uncommon. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell that targets only Zada, copy that spell for each <laughs> other creature you control that could be targeted by it. Each copy targets a different one of those creatures. I saw you just run rampant on people with this plus the, <laughs> the pump flyer spell in white. Are you talking about Splinter Twin? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, it was. It felt like it. You won every single time you popped off that combo. 
Yeah, it was sick. That 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 was actually awesome. Uh, what was that I, card I, called? The the pump spell? I forget. Aerial boost. Yeah, boy, it gave a boost to your win percentage too. Oh yeah, it was it was it was very good, and uh, I I very much enjoyed having access to to those. Like, it's that is actually the combo I think that you want. Like, there's because the other. There's not that many spells that you're really super happy to play. Angelic Intervention is another good one. By itself, Zada is obviously just a three mana, uh, three, three. a four mana three three, mm-hmm. and that's not good enough. A Hill Giant, but when you get to uh, when you get to really pop off, I think you're you're going to be pretty happy with it. My line is something like I had two aerial boosts and that was plenty, mm-hmm. just because that combo is so good. So I think if you have two tricks, that's pretty good. I'm not looking to play a bunch of bad tricks. To make this work though okay okay so you want the good stuff the stuff that really can help you win the game right away if you're gonna play a, a hill giant in your deck yeah um do you so do you want to go build around then i would like, say it's a build around like b plus because yeah. when you have that it, it is a good combo it was stupid like you even well, waited just is a good card in red white to yes. begin with and then zada is bad by itself but the combo is obscene i mean and you often waited until you had six mana and just jumped everybody else and you just won the game on the spot. It was over. Yeah. I like it. Uh, next is Urabras the Hidden. This is three red red for a 4-4 four, four legendary Phyrexian Praetor at Mythic. Uh, creatures you control have haste, which of course counts Urabrask. And then creatures your opponents control enter the battlefield tapped. <laughs> How annoying. Urabrask is basically impossible to beat if you're if you're racing. Like, or yes. you're ahead. Like, because your opponents. Your creatures get two turns of attacks before they get to block. Like, <laughs> yeah. you play Urbrask, hit them. They play a tap creature. You play another creature, hit them with both. Now their first creature can block. Their second creature can't. Yes. And it costs five mana, but still five mana, four, four haste is pretty good. I, I'd give Urbrask an A-. minus. I think it's, so, too. It's great. It plays out really well in game as well. That moves us to green. Next card is Finn the Fangbearer. This is one in a green for a 1-3 legendary human warrior at Uncommon. Finn has Death Touch, and whenever a creature you control with Death Touch deals combat damage to a player, that player gets two poison counters. I've actually played a fair bit of Finn, of, of Finn early in the format here and found Finn to be very strong, but not, not for the poison counter thing, just for no. a 1-3 Death Touch. Of course I knew you played a, a million copies of Finn because it's a two drop that your green, you know, X, you know, ramp decks are yeah, love to see. A one three death touch is really annoying. It, it, it really is. <laughs> it beats a lot of stuff and at worst ties with everything, barring a big first striker. Great with the fight cards. Really good if you could just put a plus one plus one counter on it, because a two four is even harder. Yeah. Yeah. I would give Finn a B plus. I love this guy. Just having having a Finn in your deck is always great. Agreed. And and again, the the poison thing, the build around death touch thing, those haven't really shown up for me. Um, the one downside to Finn is that, yes, you get this extra boost when it hits players, but it doesn't affect battles in any way. So it's just one power, you know, hitting your battle uh, if you are trying to be like the red green battles deck, but whatever. That's not that's not a real knock on Finn. Finn gets a B plus. Next is Goreclaw, Terror of Calcisma. This is three and a green for a 4-3 legendary bear at rare. And it says creature spells you cast with power four or greater cost two less to cast. And whenever Goreclaw attacks, each creature you control with power four or greater gets plus one, plus one, and gains trample until end of turn. And that, of course, counts Goreclaw as well. This so thing's a thumper. Four mana attacks as a 5-4 trampler, which is which solid. And you you randomly get a discount on your on your large creatures, which with the land cyclers around oh, offers yeah. offers a pretty nice little little package. I I haven't actually been taking Goreclaw that aggressively, but I think it's probably around a B. It I is. I think it's a it's a card you're happy to play. Yeah, I had a straight up red green deck that was well suited for Goreclaw and picked it up in pack three, and it was awesome. I, you know, one of the best cards in the deck for sure. Uh, next is Renata. Called to the Hunt. This is two green green for a star three legendary enchantment creature, demigod at uncommon. Renata's power is equal to your devotion to green, and each other creature you control enters a battlefield with an additional plus one plus one counter on it. It's worth noting that th- that doesn't care about green or anything. It's just every creature gets an additional plus one plus one counter. Yeah, yeah Renata's fine. It's uh 
a little slow because you, you want to play this, then play creatures after, and it's usually not that big when you play it. Works really well in the green-white deck, and it's solid in any deck that just has a good amount of creatures overall. Yeah, I think this card's quite strong in any creature-heavy deck. I, I like B for Renata. Yeah, no, that that that, sound, that sounds right. Uh, Yodora Grave Gardener is four and a green for a 5-5 five, five legendary tree folk druid at rare. And it says, whenever another non-token creature you control dies, you may return it to the battlefield face down under its owner's control. It's a forest land. It has <laughs> it no them. other types or abilities. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. It buries them and they turn into forests. It's, uh, it's pretty that's great. Funny. Eudora is just fine. I've never seen this card before, honestly. Uh, yeah, what is this even from? I, I don't know what it's from. but uh, Oh, it's from it, Commander. Oh, sure. <laughs> that explains it. Yeah, it's, it's fine. It's not, a, it's not a bomb by any stretch. I would probably play it in a heavy green deck. If, if you know, getting a couple lands out of the deal is a pretty, is a pretty good combo overall. I don't think... Uh, a five mana five five is super exciting, but I would give Yodora probably like a C plus. Like yeah. it's going to be a lower priority than cheaper cards. But if this is one of your five mana cards, then yeah, so be it. So be it. Exactly. Uh, Vornklex Voice of Hunger is eight mana, six uh, green green for a seven six legendary Phyrexian Praetor at Mythic. It's got Trample. And whenever you tap a land for mana, add one mana of any type that land produced. And whenever an opponent taps a land for mana, that land doesn't untap during its controller's next untap step. <laughs> the problem is, and, uh, is that, I'm of just... course, you've already got eight mana. So doubling your mana from that point usually doesn't do anything very yeah. productive. And your opponent probably has already emptied out the good portion of their hand at this point. So... I don't know. And for, for good reason, it's not as savage as like an actual winter orb. Mm -hmm. But when you play this, it doesn't take an, it doesn't like if they're tapped out when you play this, it doesn't make it so their lands don't untap. They get to untap and cast something and then kind of take a turn off casting. Yeah. So that's not something I'm, I'm super thrilled about. No, the, the real tough part here is just the mana cost. Like you, you have to get all the way to eight mana for, for these effects. And they're somewhat blunted by the fact that both players are at that level of mana. Uh, at the at that point in the game, you did get a huge seven six trample, you know, which is a nice body. I don't know, man. I I just always feel like the eight mana threshold demands a bit more than this. Where, where are you at? Uh, I don't like Warren Clex. I think it's basically enough. Like, okay. I just don't think you should. I think that they're like compare this to the 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 crusher, the eight eight trample hexproof. Yeah. Like that is an eight drop, which I'd consider. Though mostly I do cut that card too. It's mm -hmm. just yeah. too expensive. Eight is just too much. Eight is eight, too much. Eight needs text similar to the Elish, the seven mana Elish Norn. Yes. Before I'm starting to really or you know destroy all your opponent's creatures that sort of thing. At eight mana, you just play one of these big dorks and they go around it and attack with everything. Sometimes you die without them playing a card. Or in the case of Vorinclex, they just bounce or kill it. There's millions of ways to do that. So yeah. F for Vorinclex. Yeah. Sorry, bud. Yeah. Sorry, Vorinclex. All right, that brings us to the gold cards. Our first one is Raf Weatherlight Stalwart. This is blue white for a one three legendary human wizard at uncommon. It says whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, you may tap two untapped creatures you control. If you do, draw a card. And then you can also pay three white white to give creatures you control plus one plus one and vigilance until end of turn. Love Raf. I love Raf and Dominaria, and I love Raf here. The my favorite deck so far has been this blue-white deck that had two copies of Raph and Ooh. tons of cheap spells. And I just I, I went like seven one wow. you know, pretty easily. The deck was awesome. So with Raph, what you're trying to do, obviously, is draft a bunch of spells. Cause if you can play Raph and then play a spell and then draw a card, like it just it, it kind of chains itself. It just does everything you really want it to do. And uh it also has the ability to just pump your whole team. So the play pattern I've found with Raph is Land, Raph, you know, land, land, Raph, land creature, play a cheap spell, draw a card, play a cheap spell, draw a card. And later in the game, you just start pumping the whole team. So right. perfect fit into blue, white, uh, just really an excellent card. I, I would give Raph uh, probably an A minus. I think yeah. Raph really does deliver. Right. And it fits into the archetype in this particular plane as well. Really great card. Uh, next is Taigom Ojitai Master. This is two blue, white for a three, four legendary human monk at rare. And it says instant sorcery and dragon spells you control can't be countered. 
doesn't come up very often for us. Uh, it also says, whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell from your hand, if Tygom attacked this turn, that spell gains rebound. And rebound means you exile the spell as it resolves, and at the beginning of your next upkeep, you may cast that card from exile without paying its mana cost. So you kind of get to double up the spell over turn cycle. You have to attack and survive in the case of a sorcery, or in the case of an instant, of course, you can just attack and do it. Mm -hmm. And I mean, a five, a four mana three, four is pretty decent stats, and getting even one extra spell off this is really nice. Like, imagine you go, Tygam attack if far as dispersal now you're rebounding it like you're you're, you're, you're in the money there so you are I, and yeah. i would say tie games a b plus yeah i think so too i mean th this scenario also is just like even if you like attack with Tygom and it's going to get traded off that's fine if you have an instant you know you draw two cards it trades off you get two cards on your upkeep like you're 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 off to the races for sure uh next is yorian Sky Nomad. So this is the, the first of our companions, all of which are here. Uh, this is three blue, blue, three white, white, or three white, blue. You can choose. And it's a four or five legendary bird serpent at rare. It's got companion. And that means that you can put it in a special zone called the companion zone, but your deck has a restriction on it if you do so. In this case, your starting deck contains at least 20 cards more than the minimum deck size. So for us, that would mean you have to play a 60 card deck. It does have flying. And when Yorian enters the battlefield, exile any number of other non-land permanents you own and control, return those cards to the battlefield at the beginning of the next end step. So I think we should look at these in, in two paradigms, right, Luis? One of them is just, can you just put this in your deck? And then the other one is, should you attempt to build around it to get the companion thing going? Um, the first question for Yorian is is unequivocally yes. You should just put Yorian in your deck. It's just a really strong card. Regardless of if you've uh, done any companion stuff or even built around it, you can still just find some amount of value from it. So that bar is easily met by Yorian. Uh, you agree? Yeah. Yorian's fantastic. Five mana, four or five is already great to begin with. Flying, yeah. So, yeah, with flying. So you're not losing anything and... Trust me, there are more combos with Yorian than you think there are. Like, mm. there's just all these situations where it just is going to end up working out for you. So, what what if you blink a battle? Uh, if you exile a battle, it comes into play on its front side, regardless of which side you exile. So you get that again, and you get and then, that trigger again. Man. It's just I can't really conceive of a deck that has literal zero combos with Yorian, and even right. then, five mana, four five flying that you can always cast in blue white. You know, obviously, if you're like blue green, you're not always going to be able to cast it. Yeah, it, it's just 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 fantastic. And then, if you want to do the companion thing, so how does it work? It starts off in an exile zone. You can pay three to put it in your hand and then cast it if you've met the requirements of the deck building restriction. Yeah, which is not actually impossible here. Mm -hmm. Is it worth I, going for? I think is so. It? So I initially would have said no, but I feel like this uh, this format has enough in the way of uh, playables that you can pretty frequently end up playing your in without making too crazy uh, of sacrifices. Okay. That's interesting. It, That's interesting. I mean, get, these yeah. sets do go deep now, right? I mean, you know, there's very few unplayable cards in the formats these days. So that's interesting. So the way I would approach Yorian is I would start by assuming you're not going to companion it and just draft a deck that's good with Yorian, right? You know, maybe a slight emphasis on cards that get, that get flickered nicely, battles, ETBs, whatever. But don't, don't take, do too many speculative picks. Try to just take playables in your colors. Cause if you end up at the end with enough playables, cause you, you, you're not talking, you're talking 60 cards, but 25 of those or 26 of those can be lands. So you're talking about 10, 11 more playables than a normal deck. That's that's not impossible. How many times do you have to cut seven cards? Yeah, that if, happens a lot, actually. So if you're cutting seven cards, well, that means that uh, you, you're pretty close, to actually, to playing yeah. the Orion, right? Yeah, to companioning it. Okay. I mean, I like an A for Yorian just across the board. Yeah, I would give it an A. I mean, you get value almost every time, like you said, and, and the, the floor is extremely high. 
Uh, we'll, we'll cover that for the other companions here too. Next one is Atris Oracle of Half Truths. This is two blue black for a three, two menace. It's a legendary human advisor at rare. And when Atris enters the battlefield, target opponent looks at the top three cards of your library and separates them into a face down pile and a face up pile. Put one pile into your hand and the other into your graveyard. Great card. It draws you more than a card on average while being a three, two menace. Like you can always get two cards if you want. Yes. Um, my advice as the opponent, who's the one who has to do the splitting, is people want to take face down piles more than face up piles as a matter of just human psychology because mm -hmm. it could be anything. It could mm -hmm. be a bomb. Mm -hmm. So sometimes what you actually want to do is put the best card face up uh, even along with something else and something face down, and that could really trick your opponent. Of course, you, you know, you, you, you do have to – you do yeah. have to – to, to not, you know, get it overextend there exactly. But there are a lot of ways to get good value off of uh, the best you can do out of Atris. But still, the, the floor on this is so high that I'm, I'm happy no matter what happens. Same. I would give it an A minus or I guess maybe just an A for Atris. So you just you're just always getting at least a card and a solid three, two menace body out of it. Can we just yeah, do A? I, I like A for Atris. It's just yeah. a good card. I mean, this, this is, is really also good. this is also a pretty heavily value oriented set. Yeah. So. I think having cards like Atrus really do help. Next is Rona Shieldred's Faithful. This is one blue, black, black for a 3-4 legendary human wizard at Uncommon. Whenever you cast an instant or sorcery spell, each opponent loses a life, and you may cast Rona from your graveyard by discarding two cards in addition to paying its other costs. This card, this card actually kind of underperforms a little. Uh, not a big Rona fan. You, you don't yeah. really cast it that often because discarding two cards and paying four mana is not like the deal of a century. Every card no. matters, and that's just not that good. And then a 3-4 that pings them for one. Yeah, it's nice if you're casting spells, but it's got an awkward casting cost. Honestly, I think Rona's kind of a D. I, I just do too. I just don't think it's that good. Rona just plays as a D. Next is Grimgrin Corpseborn. This is three blue black for a five, five legendary zombie warrior at mythic Grimgrin enters the battlefield tapped and doesn't untap during your untap step. Uh, you can sacrifice another creature to untap and put a plus one plus one counter on it. And whenever Grimgrin attacks, destroy target creature, defending player controls, then put a plus one plus one counter on Grimgrin. This thing can absolutely run away with the game. Uh, very quickly. The only weakness to it is that it does, it is uh, somewhat susceptible to instant speed interaction, you know, where you sacrifice one of your creatures to get, get the train rolling and then they bounce it or kill it or something. And then you're kind of bummed out, but boy, if, if there's ever a window to untap it and start attacking, like it just takes over the game so quickly. Yeah. I, I'm a big Grim Grim fan. And, uh, I think that you're going to be very happy with this in any deck. What you want to do is draft creatures to sacrifice to it, but that's not that hard to do. Preening champion, yeah. you know, that that sort of thing. And when it's in play, you also – look, the the fail case is you sack a creature and then they bounce or kill Grim Grim, but you don't have to do that until you're right before you're about to attack. That's right. You can wait. And, mm hmm you're allowed to not activate your cards. When yes. your opponent – when you play Grim Grim <laughs> and your opponent plays their fifth land and says go with five cards in hand – it is acceptable not to activate Grim Grim. You're not you're you're not a robot. You could just not do it. So keep that in mind. Because if they tap out, even if you're sacking a real creature, if it's eating a real creature, it just turns your creatures into removal spells. Not hard to imagine ways to kind of take advantage of that with Nazumi informants and whatnot. Um, mini rant on Nazumi informant, by the way. I think a lot of people look at Virus Beetle and how good it was in uh, Neon Dynasty and are saying Nazumi informant's disappointing compared to it. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's somewhat true in the sense that it, Virus Beetle is the best this effect has ever been. Uh -huh. I've thought Nazumi Informant has been awesome. Me I've loved too. it so far. So, I'll play as many as I can get my hands on. So I, I would not I would not go ahead and, 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 and stop playing it. Okay. Yeah. And then the other thing about Grim Grin is the game does end very quickly. Um, it's it's You untap it and it's a 6-6 six, six and then you attack and destroy their best creature and it's a 7-7 seven, seven when it's attacking. Like – they can't just be like, sure, I'll just keep taking that. Like, you only need to activate this once or twice before the game's over anyway. Um, what grade do you want to give Grim Grin? I mean, it, it is not without its its baggage. Um, yeah. A minus? I mean, it still is, like, insanely powerful. 
Yeah, I would give Grimgrim an A minus. I would too. It's a great card. I'd it probably really just is. an A, honestly. Just I would give it an A minus. Come on, I, it, it, you still need to, you have to have other creatures around. You have to sacrifice. It's hard to do that though. I'm going A minus on Grimgrim. You can't give it an A. Like cards that get A's just don't ask you anything. They're just awesome on their own. This doesn't ask a whole lot, but we don't need to quibble about A minus versus A when it's an A. Uh, uh, Jiruda Doom of Depths <laughs> is next. It's. Four and two blue-black hybrid mana for a 6-6 six, six legendary demon kraken. It does have companion. Mm -hmm. Its companion ability is your deck contains only cards with even mana costs. So, you know, lands are fine. Uh, zero, two, four, six, eight. And wh what it does is when it enters the battlefield, each player mills four cards and then put a creature with an even mana cost from among those milled cards. So either the four you milled or the four they milled under the battlefield, under your control. So without companioning, great card, never cut it. Six mana, six, six, that is going to play something out of the graveyard. It's really hard to miss. I don't think I've really ever seen a Jiruda miss. It's really hard. Yeah, especially in limited. And then uh, as far as companioning it, you can do it. If, I don't I, think I, I would. I, I, I played against someone who companioned it. The, the way I would say that you approach companioning is if you get this early enough, we're talking pick one, pack one or something or very early, I could definitely see you end up in a spot where you're you're successfully able to companion this thing and uh, you just draft deadly derisions and other four mana in two mana cards, you know, and just go from there. I, I would not push for that myself. I think you give up a lot. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, it's not it's not free by any stretch. Yeah, but. I mean, I guess if it just sort of came together and it was like, oh, I could just cut a couple of threes in this random five and I'm close enough, then I would. You know, it, it is awesome if you can do that. But man, I don't know. I think if you find yourself taking like crappy twos over good threes just because you're like, no, I'm doing the Gairuda thing, I, I, I really wonder if your win percentage actually goes up at that point. At any rate, uh, Gairuda is awesome. Yeah, I would give this one an A. This also asks you. I would This too. actually asks you nothing. This and actually asks you nothing. And it is routinely a really strong two for one, like on board right now, two for one. So I like that a lot. Um, next is Jury Master of the Review. This is uh, black red for a 1-1 one, one legendary human shaman at Uncommon. It says whenever you sacrifice a permanent, put a plus one plus one counter on it. And when Jury dies, dies it deals damage equal to its power to any target. So, so here's our one, first like truly build around like aimed for a particular archetype, right? Yeah. And <clears throat> one thing to note is that uh, it's, it only triggers when you sack something, not when something dies. Yeah. Which, which is a big game. Like you do have to keep that in mind. Right. How, how playable is black, red, one, one, when it dies, it does one damage to something. I mean, I put that in my black, red decks most mm -hmm. of the time at this point. I think so and too. Yeah, and and I think overall, uh, jury is exactly what Black Red wants. You you have lots of ways to trigger it. So I I would I would give jury a B. Just if you're in Black Red, you want this card in your deck. I yeah. haven't really run into a situation where you would do otherwise. Yeah, don't think that you need to always be sacrificing things every turn to make this card okay. Next is Croxa Titan of Death's Hunger. This is Black Red for a six six legendary Elder Giant at Mythic Rare. When it enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless it was escaped. Its escape cost is black, black, red, red, and exile five other cards from your graveyard, and escaping is casting it from your graveyard with that cost and those conditions. And then it says, whenever Croxa enters a battlefield or attacks, each opponent discards a card. Then each opponent who di didn't discard a non-land card this turn, this way, excuse me, uh, loses three life. Again... Black red decks are going to be very happy with this. You can even, if you if you want to get real clever, cast it and then sack it as instant speed. If you have like an instant speed oh, way to yeah. sack it before that you sucks. have to sack it, and it's not like incredibly hard to escape it. There's a lot of ways to put cards in your graveyard. So I'd give this a B plus. It's yeah. not as busted as you might think. Again, to being anchored to constructed because there is some amount of uh, uh, you know lack of synergy. You're not playing with fetch lands or fa or, or ways yes. fable to really get the the graveyard train rolling, but it is right. very good. It is, and the, the play pattern is you pay two mana for it. 
they discard a card, maybe they lose three life, then you wait kind of a very long time, and then it comes back in the late game and takes over. You know, it really does demand answers. So that's fine. Yeah, I like B plus for Croxa. Next is Judith the Scourge Diva. This is one black red for a 2-2 legendary human shaman at rare. Other creatures you control get plus one plus zero. And whenever a non-token creature you control dies, Judith the Scourge Diva deals one damage to any target. So this is the, the card that Black Red really wants. It, it, it's quite strong there. You end up uh, pumping your whole team and then getting a lot of, lot of random pings. Judith is more like an A- minus if you're Black Red. It, yeah. It, it, it's got a lot going on. Yeah. The turn you cast it, it's very relevant many, many times. Um, yeah. So build around in the A range. And if, if you're just sort of not doing, you know, that much, it gets like slightly worse, but I mean, you're just always going to play it if you can cast it. Next is Obosh the Prey Piercer. This is three and two black red hybrid. So five mana total for a three, five legendary Hellion Horror at rare. This one does have companion and it's the opposite of Gyruda. Your deck contains only cards with odd mana costs. And if a source you control with an odd mana value would deal damage to a permanent or player, it deals double that damage to that permanent or player instead. This one, this one is, I'm not that excited about casting. It's a basically a five mana six, five that makes some of your other cards also deal extra damage. Mm -hmm. That's not, that's not crazy. Like a no, five mana I still, six, I still five have that into the B range though. Yeah, I would say it's closer to a B minus than a B plus, though. Yeah. So if that's the case, um, what's our rate of companioning? This one, I think, is a little higher because mm -hmm. giving up on two drops and not giving up on three drops is, I think, a little bit better. Yeah. Though Jairuda has the nice turn two, two drop, turn three, companion Jairuda to hand, four drop, five drop, four drop, then four drop again, then six drop. Yeah. But uh, I would say Obosh is a B minus casting, and if you can companion it, it is strong to do so, but it's just not going to happen all that often. Yeah, I agree. So B, B minus for Obosh. Next is Rada, Coalition Warlord. This is two red green for a 3-3 three, three legendary elf warrior at uncommon, and it has domain. Whenever Rada becomes tapped, another target creature you control gets plus X, plus X until end of turn, where X is the number of basic land types among lands you control generally it's going to be two there may be a third one in there occasionally you're looking Even in at the five a, color decks though mm -hmm. you're not getting four or five because they have a bunch of duels that don't count that's it's right. not dominaria where all those duels counted that's I, right i've thought rod has been pretty bad i would give rod up like a d minus it's just not been so you don't like it as four mana three three but attacks as a five five or well it can't target itself Right, so yeah. attacks with something else. It's weird yeah. because it's whenever it becomes tapped, but it doesn't have a way to tap itself outside of attacking. Yeah, I had I'm one opponent put a put the uh, play make the vehicle off of invasion of Kaladesh and then just uh, mm. tap Rada that way. That's sweet. But, yeah, but no, yeah. I'm with you though. This looks like C range for me for for Rada. It's fine. You can put it in your deck, but it often just dies the combat that it attacks. Um, Gigantha the Wellspring. This is four and a red green hybrid for a five, five legendary elemental elk. Yeah, baby Elmer in the house. This is rare and it has companion. No card in your starting deck has more than one of the same mana symbol in its mana cost. So, so you can't double have cards. double color cards. And then it taps to add Wooburg. So one of one mana of each color and this mana can't be spent to pay generic mana costs. So those are ones that are uh, just have a number basically yeah i think that uh gigantha uh, just putting it in your deck as a card you're playing is like a c plus yeah it's, it's okay. a five mana five five that taps for mana there's the fact that it can tap for a bunch of mana so it can can line up nicely just cast omnath straight up you know mm -hmm. uh so probably like actually like a b minus there but this is one of the easiest companion thresholds to meet. Mm -hmm. And if you get Gigantha early, just don't draft double colored cards. You can avoid those without paying a massive cost most of the time. Yeah, and you like, get a big benefit, a nice big creature that really you can curve to, into. To overstate how good it is to have an eighth card in your starting hand. It's incredible. Like, like, yeah, you have to pay three mana. You start with a spell in your hand that costs three and draws you a Gigantha every game. Yeah, you have eight. Every single time. That's awesome. That's it worth, is worth a it. lot. It's worth a lot. Yeah, and that and so, that moves Gigantha up into the B plus range. I honestly think it's like an A minus. A minus, like, sure. I would just take this first pick over almost everything, just because 
you can just draft such that you you ha- start with significant more resources than your opponent. That, yeah, that, no, it's true. Awesome. And it really is great. Uh, Shauna Cisse's Legacy is Nexus's green white for a zero zero legendary human warrior at uncommon. Uh, she can't be the target of abilities your opponents control, and Shauna gets plus one plus one for each creature you control. Pretty I mean, this boring. Is a, yeah, it's exactly what green white wants. Like just like the black red legends, like this is just built for the green white deck, and the green yep. white deck will play it, and that's yep. basically it. <laughs> and it's like a B. Yeah, I would say it's a B. I mean, it's just a bunch of power and toughness. It's hard to interact with, which is kind of what the doctor ordered. Next is Kihira. The Orphan Guard, this is one and then two green-white hybrid. This is a 3-2 legendary cat beast at rare with companion. Um, Kahira has vigilance and each other creature you control that's a cat, elemental, nightmare, dinosaur, or beast gets plus one, plus one and has vigilance. And as you might imagine, the companion restriction is each creature card in your starting deck is a cat, elemental, nightmare, dinosaur, or beast card. I, I assume really, that's very difficult. I haven't found this to be worth companioning or particularly good when you cast it. So I'm not very high on, uh, yeah. on Kahira. I think I it's mean, like a C in both It's like a C, places. right? Like you have to be real real uh, heavy on three mana, three, two vigilance. And 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 I'm not. So C for Kahira. Next is Lath- Lathiel, the Bounteous Dawn. Bounteous yeah. Dawn. This is two uh, green white for a 2-2 two, two legendary unicorn at rare. It's got lifelink. And at the beginning of each end step, if you gained life this turn, distribute up to that many plus one plus one counters among any number of target other target creatures. This, this card scales really nicely. This just has to be a commander card, right? Yeah, I, I don't think I've seen this card. I, I, I had not seen this card before. but I haven't either, but dang. Oh yeah, it, it it is great. I mean, by itself, if you can get it through and have it survive, that's two plus one plus one counters, and that's not like incredible or anything. But getting to scale up so quickly, I, I had a game where I had a life linker. It gets a hit in, that basically doubles its stats, then it does it again. Jeez. And like, and like, yeah, that that is going to be pretty tough for a, a lot of decks to deal with. So, I think uh, Lathiel is a build around, but like a build around a. So yeah. You really want to you really want to go hard on life gain stuff. You, that is important. Which isn't a primary thing in this format, right? So you are going to have to kind of work for it. It's not that it doesn't exist, but it's not like super pushed, right? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Luris of the Dream Den is next. This is one and two uh, black white hybrid for a three two lifelink companion. Legendary Cat Nightmare at Rare. Um, once during each of your turns, you may cast a permanent spell with mana value two or less from your graveyard. And the companion restriction is each permanent card in your starting deck has a mana value two or less. That's going to be very difficult to hit. Yes, but well, what it's I mean really is strong if you do. <laughs> you can hit it, but now your deck is is probably pretty costs. underpowered. Yeah. But Luris is maybe one of the best car- magic cards just ever printed like mm-hmm. when you have Luris around it's really easy to to get a lot of you know in- incredible turns Luris might be one of my favorite limited cards of all time just because of how fun it is to build around it because mm-hmm. it doesn't have that restriction on spells so you can have expensive spells you just have to have all your cheap creatures be really cheap all your permanents right or yeah permanents uh-huh. it, i don't think it's very and battles, unfortunately, count as permanence. I, yeah. I don't think it's very easy to companion Luris, but it's also, it's an A when you put it in your deck. It is. My guess, my guess is I wouldn't go very hard trying to companion it. That's what I think, too. I think you can just play it and get back a, a cheap thing, and if they kill it, you're fine. You got your two for one out of it. If it sticks, you might get back another thing, and that's already quite strong, but probably not worth it to make all your permanence that cheap and low-powered. You know, when limited is really, I mean, if they just play a five mana common and you're like, well, it's bigger than everything else in my whole deck and you know, they can still kill Luris. Like it doesn't get to stick around forever, every game. So, uh, so I wouldn't put all my eggs in that basket, but uh, I would definitely play Luris every time. Um, I like B plus for Luris of the dream den. Like you can Uh set up turns where you play it, play a thing right away, get your value. And then if it sticks, it can be extremely annoying for the opponent. Also just like a three powered lifelinker for three is sweet. I think it's like an A minus. I think you just cast it and cast a two drop and you're just ahead so much material right there. Yeah. Also I did uh, watch uh, BK actually play against someone who companioned Luris and had multiple ways to raise, raise dead it, get it back. That's annoying. 
And that was sick. That's really good. Yeah. <laughs> I, I, I was impressed by, th- by that. Uh, next is Tasa Karloff. This is two black white for a two, four legendary human advisor at rare. Uh, if a creature dying causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger that ability triggers an additional time and creature tokens you control have vigilance and lifelink. Very strange I've, card. I've been underwhelmed with Tasa. I've had her in white black and just had it not really do much. There's not very many death triggers etched uh, familiar is basically the only one mm. or at least the only common one that I ran into myself. And just giving your giving your Phyrexians lifelink and vigilance. I mean, there's going to be some decks where that is going to be good. But most of the time, I just wasn't that impressed with it. So but you would play it, right? I think you should be. I think it's a B. I think yeah. you just baseline. If I like, if I started the draft and my first four picks were random black and white cards that were good, I would take Tesa reasonably highly with the expectation that it would end up being good. Mm-hmm. Like you, you could play all the incubate stuff and then get a bunch of life linkers. Yeah, it doesn't buff, buff their stats though. So a two two vigilance life link isn't like attacking into a three, three, it doesn't really change that. Um, That's right. It's, it's a benefit, but it doesn't like change the game fundamentally. And, uh, I think that overall Tesa is just a straight up B and the average black white deck will want it, but not everyone will. There will be some decks that you actually will end up cutting. And if you're like a black white sacrifice deck, but don't have a lot of death triggers and don't have a lot of Phyrexians, then yeah, you can just definitely cut the card. Yeah, for sure. So B range for Tesa Karlov, but cuttable in the right deck. Next is Furia, Judge of Valor. This is two white, black, black for a 2-4 legendary angel cleric at Uncommon. Furia has flying and lifelink, and whenever you cast your second spell each turn, look at the top three cards of your library, put one of them into your hand, and the rest in your graveyard. Well, that's a bomb. Yeah, it's really slow. Mm -hmm. Like, it's five mana for a 2-4 lifelink, so it's a little underpowered in terms of cost. But if you if you cast this and it doesn't die, next turn you're probably drawing an extra card, and it does fuel itself. We've seen that in Kaldheim, right? Where you're like, play two spells, draw a card off it, get not even better better than draw a card, look at best of the top three. Then next turn, how often are you gonna be able to play two spells again yeah. most of the time? You can pick the cheap spell so that you can set it up. Two four flying lifelink, you know, it starts chipping away in the air, it becomes difficult to race. The only downside to this card really is that you just don't want to block with it the turn that you play it, because you want to get to that point where you can untap, you know, and it is a pretty good blocker at two four flying lifelink. I would give Furia Judge of Valor like a B. I mean, this still costs five mana, it's still over two colors, it still has a mana intensive mana cost. Like it is difficult to get down onto the battlefield. But it does, as you mentioned, slowly have the ability to take over. Stats are a little light, right, for a two white, black, black card. Um, They're kind of where you want them, you know, high toughness with lifelink and flying. But yeah, you know, this could have been a little bigger. I would go B plus for Furia. What do you think? I would just say B. I think that there's a lot of cards in the set that cost five mana. And if you untap with them, you're happy. This Mm, is mm. just another one of those. So There you go. It's a good one, but it's not something I'm jumping out of my, my seat for. I'd give a B for Furia. Uh, the next one, I, I really dislike this card actually in the set. It's Agar the Freezing Flame. So it's one blue-red for a 3-3 legendary giant wizard at uh, Uncommon. And this is from Caldheim as well. It says, whenever a creature or planeswalker an opponent controls is dealt excess damage, if a giant wizard or spell you control dealt damage to it this turn, draw a card. So basically what this one means is if this, you know, battles with a 2-2, you draw a card. Yep. If you cast uh, Volcanic Spite on a 2-2, you draw a card. The the really good combo is Shatter to the Source, the 5 and a red deal 6 Convoke. Oh. Where you're like, Convoke it out in blue-red. The part that annoys me is this card just doesn't work very often. The, the red land cycler is a giant as well, by the way. Mm. So, all, but all that added together, I think that uh, Agar just works a little less often than I would want. It looks like one of the gold cards that are like perfect for the color pair, but I've kind of found Agar to be medium. Look, it's a three mana three three. That's still pretty decent. It, if it ever tangles with something of lower toughness, you get a lot of value. But overall, I think uh, I think Agar is kind of like a C plus level card. Oh, you can't get up to B minus for for Agar, huh? It just hasn't played out that way for me. It's I mean, look, we're, we're in a world where three mana three three. Is just, just okay. Slightly below the curve, you know? Yeah. I, I haven't played with it yet, so I'm just going to trust you on that one. Um, next is Lutri the Spell Chaser. This is kind of the limited companion. It's a, it's <laughs> one and 
two uh, blue red hybrid for a three two legendary elementor elemental otter at rare it's got flash which is important it says when lutri enters the battlefield if you cast it copy target instant or sorcery spell you control you may choose new targets for the copy but here's the companion restriction each non-land card in your starting deck has a different name which yeah usually most i'd say most limited decks have a couple of doubled up spells but it's not that hard to to not do that and uh, that means that Lutri ends up being kind of the freest, right, to to um, to make a companion. The, some drafts, there's literally no cost to this. Mm-hmm. Most drafts, there's minor costs. Like, mm-hmm. look, when you already have a card and you're deciding between a second copy and something else, with Lutri, you just take the something else. And right. rarely will that really punish you. Yeah, you don't get to take the second Volcanic Spite, you know, as much as you would want to. And that is a real cost. But... A free 3-2 that also in blue-red, which, which you don't have to be blue-red because it's hybrid, obviously, but in straight mm-hmm. blue-red especially, you're going to have so many things to copy. It's going to be so good. So yeah. Lutri's an A. You should first pick Lutri if you see Lutri. Yeah, I, I, I have done that already in the format, and it was just awesome. Yeah, great card. And you totally can play it without companioning too. Like if it just didn't work out, let's say you got it pack three and you already had doubles of three really great cards and you're like, I'm just not going to dismantle my deck for it. You can still just play Lutri. Like that that card is totally fine on its own as well. Uh, Brutaclad Telcor Engineer. That's a new one for me too. Um, this is four blue red for a four four legendary artifact creature, Phyrexian Artificer. It's rare. Creature tokens you control have haste. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, create a 2-1 blue Phyrexian mirror artifact creature token. Then you may choose a token you control. If you do, each other token you control becomes a copy of that token. This is like a lot of nonsense, but once you see it on the battlefield with a uh, <laughs> with a incubator token, you go, oh, right, okay, I just lose, got it. Even with that one, it's a four man, a six mana 4-4 four, four that makes a 2-1 every turn, so... You're starting from, I think, a pretty decent spot. Okay. And then and then when you have token, any sort of token stuff going on, it can be really, really good. I mean, it's just it's nasty. They woke up. My opponent played this. They woke up a incubator token that was only had two counters, but it became a copy of the two one. So it's a four three. And I yep. just got slammed on for a million. And they had all had haste. Play this and turn all their tokens into one, one flyers that they had gotten off of uh, invasion of Kaladesh and just attacked me with a bunch of one, one flyers. <laughs> yeah. So it, it's weird because it, it all, it, yeah. So this card really impressed me the only time I've seen it on the battlefield, but it's only been once. So I, I don't know if that's just going to happen all the time, but it seems awesome to me. I played against it twice. It's been good for my opponents both times. I I, I would say Brutoclad is like an A minus. Yeah, that's like, what I think too. Pretty good value generating machine, you know. Yeah. A for Brutoclad. Next is uh, Dina, Dina. I can't remember. A uh, Soul Steeper. This is black green for a one three legendary Dryad Druid at uncommon. Whenever you gain life, each opponent loses one life. Uh, and then you can pay one and sacrifice another creature to give her plus X plus zero until end of turn where X is sacrifice creatures power. Uh, Does this have a place in this format? This feels like two abilities that don't really fit that well. No, I think Dina's pretty close to like, it can't be an F cause it's a two mana one three with like some abilities, but it's a D I just don't think it works. Yeah, I honestly, like I didn't think this one really worked that well in Strixhaven either. It's just a kind of a weirdly awkward card. It is. It doesn't really fit. Next is Umori the Collector. This is two and two black green hybrid for a legendary ooze. It's rare. It's a four five. It is a companion. And it says as Umori enters the battlefield, choose a card type. Spells you cast of the chosen type cost one less to cast. And companion is each non land card in your starting deck shares a card type basically all creatures the only way you can make that work in limited so you can play a you know 23 creature 17 land deck and get to and always get access to umori which and can be strong and, yeah that seems it, bad there's something to playing against the all creature deck i played against someone who companioned this and knowing they 
can't have anything. <laughs> but like they just can't straight up can't have uh, yeah. anything. anything. <laughs> like that's very know, they, freeing, right? Yeah. Like, <laughs> you don't have to play around anything ever. It's also like they don't get to play removal. They don't get to play card draw. That yeah. I think so. The question is, since we're very likely not going to be companioning in Amori very often, how do we feel about two black, black, two green, green, or two black, green for a four, five that does let you in cheapen some type of card, no matter what? It's fine. It's great. Yeah. I mean, you play this turn four, you make, you name creatures, you play a six drop next turn. Or if you just have an expensive battle in your hand, you can just name battle yeah. and then play an invasion of Lorwyn on turn five or something like that. And then attack it with Umori. Sounds great to me. Yeah. <laughs> I'm going to say B plus on Umori. It just sounds like a pretty good card. I agree. It's just a super solid card. Very flexible mana cost too. Next is Rayav Master Smith. This is red white for a 2-2 legendary dwarf artificer at Uncommon. Whenever a creature you control that's enchanted or equipped attacks, that creature gains double strike until end of turn. The combo here is Ramosian Greatsword, the four and a red, mm. Convoke, plus three, plus one. And I've managed to line that up. Is it trample it, too? Oh, yeah. It oh, is sick. You're just like, nasty. plus three, plus one, gives it double strike, <laughs> gives it trample, and, and you just get to slam in there. And uh, I would play Rayov in any deck that had that. And even with the, the core halberd, the plus one, plus one and Vigilance card, I mean, that is still pretty strong because you're playing a two mana two, two, which red, white is pretty into anyway. All you need is – this is a little like uh, uh, Vajruk, the 3-2 that makes Elementals of Valduk, mm -hmm. but I think a lot better because the actual swings here are much bigger than when, when you do get it going. Yeah. So I would give Rayav uh, – I'd build around B+. If yeah. you have like a couple pieces of equipment, this card is going to be a good card in your deck. Otherwise, you probably just don't play it, right? I mean, yeah, two you man, just don't play it. gold 2-2 two is a little tough. Uh, next is Zerta the Dawn Waker. This is one and two red-white hybrid for a 3-3 three, three legendary elemental fox at rare. It does have companion. Abilities you activate that aren't mana abilities cost two less to activate. This effect can't reduce the mana of that cost to less than one mana. And you can pay one mana and tap it to have target creature can't be blocked this turn. And the companion cost, or restriction I should say, is each permanent card in your starting deck has an activated ability. So that's impossible. In yeah, lands naturally do, but yeah, this isn't going to be companioned. In an aggressive deck, Zerta's fine. Three mana, three, three, that makes it, can, can take out a blocker is okay. Yeah. It makes your incubates all cost one. It You know, it randomly saves you mana here and there. But yeah. it's like a C plus. It's not yeah. anything too special. Yeah, that's okay. Next is Aurelia, the war leader, the hero of the vintage cube. This is two <laughs> red, red, white, white for a three, four legendary angel at mythic rare. She has flying vigilance and haste, and whenever she attacks for the first time each turn, untap all creatures you control. After this phase, there is an additional combat phase. Uh, this I'm is in a game winner. Yeah, I mean, if you're red white, this is the six drop you want. Attacks for six by herself, and if you have anything else that can attack in, imagine you just had like a two-two flyer. All of a sudden, you get to attack in for ten. Yeah, you know that's the, the that's game a pretty big very swing. quickly. Yeah, a, and a, a, a minus for Aurelia. I think. Yeah, I really like Aurelia. Next is Fire Song and Sun Speaker. This is a four red white for a legendary Minotaur cleric at rare. It's a four six that says red instant and sorcery spells you control have life link, and whenever a white instant or sorcery spell causes you to gain life. Fire Song and Sunspeaker deals three damage to target creature or player. I, I guess the combo here is uh, Stoke the Flames. You play this, you stoke and gain four, but it doesn't even trigger the second ability because it's not a white card. So I, I would say Fire Song and Sunspeaker looks like pretty close to an F to me. I'm I just think not so too. That interested. I just can't really see how it fits. Yeah. yeah. Um, this next one is called Eryxmethy's Slumbering Isle. This is two green blue for a 12 12 legendary Kraken. Four mana 12 12. Uh, it enters when it, it enters the battlefield tapped with five slumber counters on it. <laughs> and as long as it has a slumber count on it, it's a land. So it's a tapped land. Um, whenever you cast a spell, you may remove a slumber counter from it. It taps to add green blue. Okay, so, so what happens? So it ETBs tap it, then it does so untap. Imagine, imagine you paid four mana for a double ramp spell because because this it enters tapped, but then 
taps for two mana. Okay. And then once you've played five spells, you get a 12-12. Okay, so it does tap for the mana. Gotcha. All right. I mean, this is kind of like Invasion of Zendikar, honestly. Where, this is, yeah. Where you, you play this, you get two lands, and then the the... The the quest here is to just play five spells, not attack it. But e- either way, yeah. after a little bit of time, you end up getting a huge 12-12 out of the deal. I, I think uh, Eric Methies is what blue-green decks tend to want. And this format does seem to allow, you know, spending turn four ramping is not a death sentence here. So Yeah, and you get this huge dumb, I mean, it's just a 12-12, but still, that's massive. I kind of like this card. It's also cool. Yeah, yeah I do too. B? So I... I, I like B for Eric's Methies. Yeah. You you want to have a high curve, which obviously kind of works across purposes where then, you know, how are you playing five spells? But a normal cur- a normal ramp deck will still have some spells that are cheap, and then this this works nicely with those. It also just ramps you to your seven, sevens and sixes and what have you. So, All right. So B, trending towards B plus for Eric's Methies slumber, Slumbering Isle. Next is Izuri Claw of Progress. This is two blue green for a 3-3 legendary Phyrexian elf warrior at Mythic. It says whenever a creature with power two or less enters the battlefield under your control, you get an experience counter. And at the beginning of combat on your turn, put X plus one plus one counters on another target creature you control where X is the number of experience counters you have. Wow. Yeah, I don't really know how to feel about Azuri because... You, when you play Azuri, it doesn't do anything. And then later you play a two power creature, maybe next turn, you get an experience counter. And then at the beginning of combat, you get another plus, you get you start distributing those plus one, plus one counters. Yeah. It's I pretty mean, you, slow, but you honestly, only need to get one. If your opponent played this on turn four and you couldn't kill it, you'd feel pr- kind of bad, right? Really you'd think, bad. You'd think, okay, this isn't going to go well for me. So that makes me think Azuri is probably like a B plus. Yeah, I think so too. I mean, the the play pattern is just they play it, they play the small thing, and then you just you don't have to spend the experience counter, right? You just no, every no, you combat. keep rack, racking them up. I mean, yeah. if if you play a Zuri and then get two counters out, you you will uh, you you will you will just kind of overrun them really quickly. It is a not great top deck and kind of slow. Yes, but I think. I think once you get past that, I think it does look pretty good to so me. So I'll say B. Like, it, it does have its significant downsides, but that card, if you just get an experience counter, is going to take over. All right, this next one is kind of the Luis Scott Vargas <laughs> uh, team card. It's Emoti Celebrant of Bounty. What does this thing do? It's three blue-green for a 3-1. Uh, <laughs> also, the, the invocation with normal text just looks like not a real magic card, so I, I, I don't close. love it. But yeah. anyway... Five mana, three, one, legendary Naga Druid at an uncommon. It has Cascade, so when you play it, you reveal cards from the top of your deck until you reveal a non-land with, with lower mana cost, then you get to cast that card right away. So you for get free. to cast a four or less card for free. And it also has the text, spells you with mana value six or greater, <laughs> spells you cast with mana value six or greater have Cascade. <laughs> so you want to hear a sick combo with I- I- Emoti. I do. You you play Emoti, you cascade, whatever. Then you immediately attack and, and kill a six-mana battle like Invasion of Lorwyn. And then when you cast Windowing Forces, you cascade. Oh, that's disgusting. So they have that mana cost there. It, it, it's actually really sick. Oh, that's great. And then you untap the next turn, cast something that costs six, which is on curve, and, and you're off to the races. How good is this card? It's Okay. You, if you have two or three cards that cost six, which is not an unreasonable number in these blue green decks, like look, paying five mana for a three one plus a three drop at random is decent. Or, or it, four, right? Well, I was getting to that. It, Sorry, paying five mana for a three one plus a ah, four drop is good, understood. and then getting a two drop is just is is just okay. You're probably yeah. like kind of close to par, but like. Most of the time, you're going to get a three or a four, which means it's on its face. This card kind of justifies itself. Yeah. And then here's the annoying part. I've played with and against this card a bunch of times now. When you play this and you cascade into something, your opponent now has to decide, God, do I use a removal spell on this idiot 3-1? Because if I don't, and then their next turn is play a Timberland Guide or whatever a six-mana land cycler is and there's Cascade, I'm going to feel really bad, like it's terrible. But also using a removal spell on this means the person with Emoti got a clean two-for-one and yeah. pro- probably up on mana because they played a spell for free. Right. Yeah, so, no, that's a lot to like. I mean, th- th- these, I, every one of these scenarios favors the person playing Emoti, uh, sometimes a little bit and sometimes a lot. 
Yeah, like even if you're behind where just when cards like this are at their worst, a 3-1 plus a random cascade that costs four or less is probably going to help you stabilize the board to yeah, some degree. Definitely. If not, I don't really know what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, if not, you should uh, carefully choose the cards you put into your library in the future. What grade does Emoti get? I have yet to play with her again. So I, this looks great to me. Like I've like not a- really seen anything I don't like. B plus, I think, is probably about okay. where I'm at. The, the biggest downside is when you play against an aggro deck and a 3-1 is just going to trade for their two drop and you cascade and you hit, like, if you hit, like, you know, the burgeoning in land enchantment or something yeah. like that. Yeah. Like, one of the things with the mode is you kind of make sure you have some good meaty threes and fours to hit. Okay. B plus, A minus if you build around it, maybe, like. Definitely has a high upside. Next is Karuga, the Macro Sage. This is three and uh, two blue-green hybrid, so five mana total for a 5-4 legendary dinosaur hippo at rare. It's got companion. When Karuga, macro Sa- the Macro Sage, enters the battlefield, draw a card for each other permanent you control with mana value three or greater. And the restriction is your starting deck contains only cards with mana value three or greater and land cards. I would generally not recommend companioning <laughs> Karuga. Mm-hmm. <laughs> I think even for this format, which is not the fastest, guaranteed not starting until turn three is a pretty big drawback. You, so, need, to, you need to win a lot of die rolls to make that work. Right. right. <laughs> or, or have like multiple wraths in your deck. You yeah. Know, that sort of thing. Yeah. So I wouldn't be looking to companion Karuga, but it's a pretty good addition to almost any deck that can cast it because – Blue and green are the colors that have this stuff. And, you know, you're like skittering surveyor, you know, X, Y, Z, find, get, get this Karuga going. That, that's pretty sweet. Yeah, I, I would definitely play it uh, just at, <clears throat> excuse me, at uh, face value. What do you want to give it? I'd give it a B. Like, again, there's just a lot of cards that cost five mana that are decent. I Look, this one gives you the value right away. That, that's obviously a pretty big upside. <clears throat> but it doesn't, I'm still not going to take Karuga over like a good removal spell or something along those lines. Yeah. Next is Yarok the Desecrated. This is one of my favorites. This is two black, blue, green for a three, five legendary elemental horror at mythic with death touch and lifelink. And if a permanent enters a battle, entering the battlefield causes a triggered ability of a permanent you control to trigger that ability triggers an additional time. It doubles all your ETBs. <laughs> this card is like Which the value train. Includes battles. It doubles all your battles. Oh, God, it does? Oh, yeah, you're those are permanents. Come to me, baby. I love you this card. You gain two life off the game lands, you know? We're, oh, yeah. Oh. We, we've, we've got a lot of action here. Uh, and it's a 3-5 lifelink. It also has death touch, but it's a 3-5 life. Like They can't just attack into it. It stabilizes an entire board. Yeah, no, I think uh, I think that Yurok is a very good card. The casting cost is tough. Triple Very. color is not is not free, but honestly, I think that uh, I think that Yurok is worth stretching your mana for. My guess is at three colors, you're still probably better off taking like the you know gr- deadly derision, the kill any creature, make a treasure, that sort of thing. But it's honestly not that far away from uh, being being the sort of thing that like if I have two black cards and I see Yurok third, yeah, I'm probably kind of into that. I mean, come on. If if you're taking Deadly Derision over Yarok, like, you have to question your life. Like, what are you doing this for? You know? Like, don't you want to <laughs> live? Don't you want to feel something? Yeah. I mean, I agree with you, though. The mana cost is tough. Even though it is supported in the format with the duels and all that stuff, you should be able to make it work. It's not like you're banging your head against a wall, but that doesn't make it easy. I mean, if you can get the card down, it's already B plus A minus range just for 3-5 lifelink death touch because... That stabilizes the board. And then you have this ability just hanging there, waiting to start giving you value. But, you know, this isn't cube. You don't get to just draft every creature with an ETB, every permanent with an ETB. It doesn't really work like that. So, I don't know. I, I would probably go B plus trending towards A minus for Yarok because of the combination of a little bit of setup cost plus the mana cost. Yeah. Yurok is an A-level card Definitely. with a, with a B-level mana cost. <laughs> yes, exactly. So, and a little bit so, of setup. So if you're like if you if you're black green and in pack three and you open Yurok and you have two dual lands and a skittering surveyor, like just slam the Yurok. It's gonna be great in your deck. Yeah. But 
first picking it, yeah, you should probably be a little cautious there. Plus you have a skittering surveyor, like Yarrock skittering surveyor. Let's do it. Another mini rant. People don't take skittering surveyor on arena. Oh my I God. I got one like seventh pick. I'm like, what are you people doing? You got, it's colorless. I got one of five cards in the pack. Oh no. Oh, oh really week, good. week one a of a new card. format, baby. <laughs> well, here's the thing. People who didn't play in Dominaria did not see the absolute unit that Skittering Surveyor ended up being, and that wasn't even a three-color format. That's totally right. And this is. And yes, cards have gotten better. Limited's gotten a little more assertive. That's all true. Skittering Surveyor is is still the man. And uh, I think yes. that people who are like wanting me to cut it from my like two-color decks when I'm streaming, I'm just like, no, I'm not going to do that. Skittering Surveyor is so good. Deeply offensive and worthy of an insta ban. Uh, next is Atraxa Praetor's Voice. This is green, white, blue, black. So everything but red. For a 4-4 legendary Phyrexian Angel Horror, this is Mythic. And it has Flying, Vigilance, Death Touch, and Lifelink. And at the beginning of your end step, Proliferate. The original Atraxa, this, this is actually a pretty easy grade. It's a build around A, yeah. where if the mana works then you can play the card. And if it mana doesn't work, then you cannot play the card. And it's something you have to kind of do go on a quest to do. That's right. And so. you need to push for it. Like this isn't a couple of duels. This is like, I have a lot of fixing, a lot of ability to, to get extra colors of mana. But if you do, it pays you off. It's similar to this, our last card, which is Niv Mizzet Reborn, which costs the full Wooburg, bl you know, white, blue, black, red, green for a six, six flying legendary dragon avatar at mythic. And then it has an enter the battlefield ability. Reveal the top 10 cards of your library. For each color pair, choose a card that's exactly those colors from among them. Put the chosen cards in your hand that rests on the bottom in a random order. So any straight up two color cards you get, as, but you don't get multiples of the same two colors. Um, I actually have already played this card uh, in my deck and I did cast it multiple times. It is awesome as a 6-6 six, six flying dragon. I didn't have that many hits for it. I think I had three or four or something like that. And it still hit sometimes. Like sometimes it just drew me an extra card, which was nice. I actually drafted the battle that's Wooburg and that's what I was building towards. But I figured, hey, while I'm here, I might as well throw a Niv-Mizzet Reborn in. And I'll tell you, when you turn five a Niv-Mizzet Reborn, it is huge. And sometimes you get an extra card off it. If you're able to actually build around it, it can become devastating where like you play it, you get three cards, you know, from the guilds or whatever off of it. And if, even if they kill the Niv Mizzet, you can take over the next turn. Um, this also has that build around grade that we mentioned with Atraxa. You absolutely have to build your entire deck with the, uh, with the ability to cast cards like this, if you're going to do it, but I'll tell you, Luis, you can, I already did. Yeah. And likewise, yeah, just give it. I've played Invasion of Alara. It's been good. You know, like there there are things you can do here. So I would give Niv Mizzet build around A. Like if you can build around into yep. it, it, it does the job. Otherwise, it doesn't quite. All right. Okay. So let's call it a show there. Um, we'll do the, um, we'll do our initial impression slash format overview in the next episode, which will come out uh, almost directly after this one does. Um, because we have had our chance to draft the set already. We want to get those thoughts out into the world. But that is going to do it for this episode. Hopefully you found it useful. If you did, um, great. Thanks for hanging out with us. We really appreciate it. You can find everything related to the show over at lrcast.com. That's all the episodes of the show. You can find the set reviews for this uh, set as well as every other one we've ever done going way back now. Um, uh, and again, that's lrcast.com. If you want to support us directly, it's patreon.com slash limited resources. And we want to say thanks once again to everybody who supports us there. If you want to find us on social media, I'm Marshall underscore LR and Luis is LSV. That's going to do it for this one. We'll see you shortly. I've got a, a, a mini rant here because this mm -hmm. is the, that's the theme of the episode about uh, Frexian Sensor. Have you run into this one yet? Uh, no. Blue and a white for a 3 3 Frexian. Oh, Players can't play more yes, than one I Frexian have. spell per turn. Do you know where I'm card. going with this? I hate it. I've ran into it twice. And they can't play more than one uh, non Frexian spell per turn, and non Frexian creatures come into play uh, tapped. Ugh. So the the main thing that I, that I have a problem with here, honestly, is. When you play a battle, if you flip the battle, if you've already played a spell, there's a Frexian sensor in play, you can't play the battle. Oh my. I didn't even run into that. It was annoying enough without that. That's horrible. How did they put that in here? 
I don't know. It's really bad. So you end up in a spot where like you, you know, you've got a battle in play. You're like, kill your blocker, attack, attack, kill my battle. And then, and then you, you just lose the battle. It gets exiled and you can't put it on the stack. You're, and it doesn't matter who controls the sensor. The sensor just affects both players. It's just such a trap where people, how many thousands of people have already done this? Oh, for it just, sure. It just seems like such an unbelievable trap. And I think these cards are already kind of unpleasant to play with anyway. Uh-huh. Like, like the sensor type cards. And that's fine. I mean, some amount of these are okay. Stop combo decks, whatever. But just having this interaction, I think is really poor. And honestly, I think battles should have not put been put on the stack. I think they should have just transformed. And look, there's two battles that have spells on the other side. So they have to get exiled and replayed. Every, all the rest of them are permanents. I think they should have just made them all permanents and, and just, just had them and all it transformed. it just happens. And it just ha- – like also have you uh, misclicked on, yes, I would like to cast my transform battle? I talked to a mutual friend of ours yesterday who said he already accidentally said <laughs> no or whatever and just didn't get it. <laughs> and yeah, it's like, that, why is that a thing? Like, obviously, you attacked it. You want the dang thing. Yeah. So, like, how are you going to attack a battle and then go? No, no, I just don't want the spell. Yeah, that part like, is weird. I do really like the battles overall. I think it's a cool too. card type. I think they play out well, and we've got more thoughts on them on our, in our first, uh, you know, dedicated episode. But I just think that uh, the Frexian sensor interaction is just untenable. Like, it just it horrendous. must not have come up in front of the right person because most of the people I know who would see this would would I think naturally be like oh wait no we can't do that like there's just no reason to do that just put this in a different set or something yeah